So let me talk a little bit about different models, different explanations. Now, a security model for nuclear weapons suggests that countries acquire nuclear weapons when their security environment is so extreme, they face a threat that they can't get security unless they acquire their own nuclear weapons. And the security model sees nuclear proliferation as a kind of chain reaction. Nuclear history is explained as the United States getting nuclear weapons, fearing the Germans would get them during the Second World War. Stalin and the Soviet Union getting nuclear weapons because of the United States. Britain and France getting nuclear weapons because of the Soviet Union. China, after the threats the United States issued at the end of the Cold War, or at the end of the Korean War, felt threatened by the United States nuclear weapons, and the Russians backed away from their agreements to help the Chinese, so they built their own nuclear weapons, and Kim Jong-il is seen as a leader acquiring nuclear weapons because of the threat from the United States. The Non-Proliferation Treaty is seen as a solution to a free rider problem. That is, the NPT is seen as a solution for countries that don't want nuclear weapons if their neighbors uh, are restrained from getting them. As I mentioned earlier, perhaps if your neighbors won't get them, you won't get them as well, and that's a helpful potential use. There are other countries as well. Why would country restrain? Well, Willy Brandt might have been restrained partly because of the U.S. security guarantee and partly because he thought that if he acquired nuclear weapons, lots of other neighbors would get them. The South Koreans restrained themselves from getting nuclear weapons in part because of the U.S. security guarantee and in part at the time because they were concerned about what effects it would have on North Korea. And the Egyptians may have gotten rid of the nuclear weapons program because they feared that all other Arab states would rush forward and they reluctantly accepted that perhaps Israel uh, having nuclear weapons was better than uh, having a uh, widespread spread of nuclear weapons in the Middle East. It does suggest and help you understand why the Egyptians are so concerned and keep pushing for a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East and keep insisting that their restraint should be coupled with an Israeli uh, commitment to disarm. Nuclear weapons, however, should not be seen only as a defensive mechanism. Indeed, we now have evidence from the Saddam Hussein archives that nuclear weapons in Iraq were seen as a potential shield behind which Iraq could use conventional forces more aggressively. The quote you have here is from Saddam Hussein arguing in a private meeting that if they got a nuclear weapon, it would guarantee that they could fight a long war, that is a long conventional war, destructive to our enemy, by which he, refer, he was referring to Israel, and take at our leisure every meter of land and drown the enemy with rivers of blood. We consider losses in the thousands, thousands that we plan to be prepared to lose in those 12 months, 50,000 martyrs and keep going. So I'm saying didn't think that he could conquer all of Israel, if he got nuclear weapons, but did think that they were a shield in which Israel could not escalate and use its weapons against Iraq while in Iraq attacked Israel and, the, uh, and occupied territories with conventional forces. The Iraqi nuclear weapons also posed a very severe uh, danger. That is, if they had acquired nuclear weapons, the inspectors who saw their weapons design were very concerned that if they had gone forward and been permitted to go forward with their weapons, if a single bullet hit one, it might have gone off. I wouldn't want to be around it if it fell off the edge of the desk, one of the inspectors said. And there are also dangers about pre-authorized use creating an unauthorized activity. After all, Saddam Hussein knew that if there was a nuclear attack on Baghdad, that he would potentially not be able to give orders. So there is some evidence that Saddam pre-delegated authority to launch, for example, Scud missiles with biological weapons in 1991 suggesting that he might have done so with nuclear weapons had he acquired them. So that's the first model. It looks at security mechanisms. And I think the security arguments can take you a long way, but can't explain all cases. Because there are other cases, India in 1974, and maybe even in 1998 when it tested again, the South Africans and the Japanese, in which domestic politics plays, I think, a predominant role. Mrs. Gandhi in 1974 
had a capability to acquire nuclear weapons. Indeed, the Indians, a security model would suggest, would have been rushing to get nuclear weapons after the Chinese tests in 1964, but they didn't. They leisurely developed a program, and in 1974, the scientists came to Mrs. Gandhi, who was in the middle of a domestic crisis, the emergency, and presented her with the option that we can test a weapon, a peaceful nuclear device. They said, it's a peaceful nuclear device. People will uh, love it at home, but people abroad won't punish us, won't put sanctions on us because we haven't signed the treaty, and it's only for peaceful purposes, to, uh, to uh, use for mining purposes, etc. Mrs. Gandhi, facing a domestic crisis, wanted to shore up her domestic support as being a tough leader, went ahead and approved of a nuclear test. And then afterwards, when the sanctions were put on, despite what the scientists have said, they went back to her and said, can we test again? We want to do some more testing. And she said, absolutely not. Domestic politics, not the international environment, were important, even though the international environment ended up telling her not to do it again. South Africa, some people could explain the South African decision to get rid of their nuclear weapons, saying they weren't threatened because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and therefore they could safely give this up. However, if you actually look at the timing and read the documents, it's clear that many people in South Africa, even those favoring within the white regime, the transfer of power to black majority rule, were greatly concerned about what would happen if you get rid of apartheid there could be a potential conflict between radical whites and radicals within the ANC. And do you want to have nuclear weapons during that potentially messy or dangerous tran uh, transition period? So again, they got rid of the weapons because of domestic change, not because of an international change. And the Japanese as well, I think, should be seen in a domestic context. As the Japanese have very strong what's called an allergy against nuclear weapons because of their experience in 1945 and because of the nuclear tests in the Pacific, which hurt Japanese fishermen and greatly damaged them. And so Japan, even when it faces security threats, there's relatively little pressure from the public to acquire nuclear weapons. Indeed, it's exactly the opposite. There's pressure to move away and to be a very good reformer and encourage other countries to get rid of nuclear weapons rather than Japan acquiring them. So the Non-Proliferation Treaty in this model empowers reformers. It creates industries that have an interest in keeping nuclear energy safe and secure and not tying it in with military purposes. A third explanation looks at norms. Now, a norms model suggests that countries acquire weapons not just because of security interests, not just because of domestic political interests, but because creating weapons that are the most modern weapon is what countries do. If you want to be a strong power, you have to have the strongest weapons. And people will look at the prestige involved with having the strongest weapons and say that that's really important. If you look at France, for example, why did France feel it was so important under Charles de Gaulle to acquire nuclear weapons? Well, de Gaulle once said that France will not be France if it does not have nuclear weapons. Once a major power, after the Second World War being a country in great decline, to shore up the prestige of France, the radiance of France, France felt, the French government felt it needed to have some nuclear weapons. The Ukraine and other countries might be a good example of a different kind of norm. The Non-Proliferation Treaty could create, instead of the norm that any country that can should get a nuclear weapon for prestige, the NPT says that no, there are new norms of positive behavior. You can um, follow the agreements that you sign, and if you develop nuclear weapons, you'll be in that bad category like North Korea or Iran. And the NPT then creates a nor new norm of positive behavior, suggesting that strong states are legal states to follow the commitments they have made. 